things that underlies all of the hits, which is uh, very much in my realm as a designer, is uh, virtual economies. So um, there's a few exceptions, um, but most of the hit games, um, if you look at the top 20 list, have underlying in virtual economy. You get coins, usually there's two currencies, um, you know, an earned one and a purchased one, and there's stuff you can buy. And so there's very consumerist underpinnings to it, and then you can dress it up as a treasure island or a farm or a vineyard or whatever, you, or a fish tank. But um, those <coughs> games have um, a play pattern that fits really well into Facebooking. And they've got an engagement loop with um, currency and virtual spending and choices that I think is really fascinating. And also, I think, speaks to recessionary times. I know for myself, I can't buy the clothes that I might lust after um, these days, or, you know, a lot of people have tightened their belts. But I can get it in Facebook, and I can get my avatar dressed up really fine. <laughs> and, you know, there's something that, so I think that that's a whole other conversation, but basically virtual goods, that's the business model that's eating the games industry right now, is free to play, monetized with some form of virtual goods and virtual services. And all the Facebook games that are making a lot of money, that's what they're doing. And I think that says something about us as a culture as to that being very effective for our entertainment dollars. And, and, you know, if you're delivering an experience through a virtual good and enhancing your gameplay through, through a good virtual good, it's not that different from paying to go see a movie. You know, it's, you're paying for an experience. One of the things that, that I kind of have a fun time doing is perusing the bottom of the charts. You know, so the, the compare, so the, the, you know, the number... 20,000 Facebook games, um, and when you go look at the ones on the bottom, I mean, I just, I just think that part of the thing not to overlook for the ones at the top is they just work. When you start going down to like number 1,000, number 5,000, they don't work, you know, and so there's a certain element of just like product quality, um, and I think you can, I mean, there's certainly a lot of other, but just don't overlook the importance of like your servers have to have fast response time and you got, you know, when you click on something it needs to work and you can't be hidden error messages all the time. I mean, just the basics. And I think two, two opinions. One is that I think the thing that's beautiful about the technology industry is that um, the first ones into the market are almost never the ones who win in the end, right? Um, does anybody remember Netscape or Excite? Or even, you know, AOL. I mean, sure, there was a lot of great stuff done along the way, and those companies were certainly successful, but there's a whole new set of players today, right? And so I think um, this, uh, this valley, you know, technology in general, is built on innovation and people who have a dream and who have a passion. And so I don't think you should ever, you know, get scared by, there's already somebody who's really big in a space. If you've got a great idea, it does require innovation. But I think the big guys have all kinds of weaknesses, right? I mean, David slew Goliath, and I think any, you know, there are lots, right? I mean, there are lots of instances where if you sit down and think about it, you can identify where the weaknesses are. Um, and I think part of it is, you know, my belief on, uh, you know, innovation oftentimes comes from when a company gets very, very big, they often lose touch with their customer. They lose touch with, with the changes, they become stuck in their ways, they, ha they develop processes and systems, and that's how things work. Um, I mean, viral marketing is, is very much so, it's, it's a sale, uh, and it's two sales. Um, you have to sell your user on being your salesman, and you have to make him a good enough salesman that he closes the deal for you. Um, and you know there are parts of that that are I can very easily say, okay, you know, you know, uh, if if your if your target market, if your target salesman that you want to go sell this to his friends, um, is presented with something that is clearly uh, you know language that's uh, it's too professional and stuffy sounding. I mean that's not going to convert nearly as well as colloquial conversations do. All right, that's very easy for me to say and like put in front of you. Um, at the same time, like. You know why is this word better than this word in this culture? I mean, a lot of that is intuition and understanding, like the way people respond to words, and that's not that's that's not something that you can always look up. It's ever changing and ever evolving, just like language is. So, what's a good sales pitch today is not necessarily a good sales pitch in six months, right? 
because everyone's like, oh, I've heard this sales pitch. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a constantly evolving and, and, and adapting thing as well. So that makes it um, very difficult to quantify and just say, you know, oh, you know, you know, pat yourself on the back, you're done. As a female, knowing what you're good at and what you want and being clear about your goals and being clear with your employees and straightforward is a person thing, not a female thing. And honestly, probably the best managers I've ever worked with were men. I learned a lot from them. I've worked with a number of women, and I don't think there's any golden thing about being a woman. On the design side, though, I have been hired a number of times for my skill, but because I was female, and the design team knew they needed females. The Sims was a good example of that, Will Wright always has um, pretty equal balance male-female on the teams. Maxis is unusual. You walk into that company, although it's now EA, you see half the room is female. And that's part of why they made the games they made. So I think, you know, certainly on the design side, often people design for themselves. But I think for people, getting in touch with your style and your goals, what you want to be is the most important thing, and gender, frankly, is somewhat secondary. People, like, if you're not ashamed of your product on day one, you launched it too late. <laughs> it, 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 it's true. Right? Yeah. That, that's, why, that's what I'm talking about, oh. minimum viable product. Yeah, yeah. What truly is the minimum viable product? You should without be the, yeah, put it, put it out there, see if it catches people's attention, see if it grows. If it does, just keep working on it like crazy hours working on it. And if it doesn't, nice try, moving on. And double, double down on the parts that users respond to, right? You may be surprised by what your users like. You know, your certain assumptions of like, oh, my users are going to spend a ton of time doing this. And if you, you know, develop you know, like V1 of that feature and no one likes it, oh, thank God you didn't perfect it, right? I mean, if, if it doesn't resonate with your users, you know, you, you, you have the luxury of knowing, sweet, that sucks. I'm glad I didn't spend six months on it. I think the important thing about these guys are mentioning, just to remember in social games, which may or may not be obvious, is you're going to spend more man hours after it launches than before. The, the real, I think somebody said the real hard work starts after you launch. Yeah. 100% true. 1,000% true, really. But it'll be good because you'll know that it worked. Exactly. Oh, yeah. right? Get Women 2.0's monthly email blast with upcoming events and workshops for startups. Sign up at www.women2.org.